Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to devlog number seven. First things first, channel update. I'm really excited because at the time of editing this episode, I'm at 450 subscribers, which is really amazing. A challenge was recently posed to me in the comments, and I've decided that once I reach 500 subscribers, I'll add Vulcan support to my game engine. So if you're not already subscribed and want to see that, please subscribe. It really helps out the channel, and I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Last time, I worked on adding support for multi-pass rendering, which opened doors to a lot of different rendering techniques. I also spent a lot of time designing some retro-looking assets. Today I'm going to build on this by writing some new shaders and filling in the placeholder assets that are in the game now. First of all, we need to address this player character. Let's just say it looks like he's been skipping leg day and arm day, so I added a bit of heft to almost make him look like some kind of surfer or bodybuilder guy. Next, we can start painting. For all the assets that you'll see in this video, I very carefully made sure that they all had roughly the same pixel density. It can be very off-putting if certain objects have way more detail than others, or if the art style randomly changes. Even if both of the assets are good on their own, you'd be much better off having uniformly high or low pixel density. All right, so Serial Guy here has just gotten back from the gym, and I'm not gonna lie, I am very jealous of these gains. He is thick. When he's dressed up, he looks something like this. I think this is definitely an improvement. I did some finishing touches on the player and just made him a bit more presentable, and I'm pretty happy with the result. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but the problem is, this world is really not looking good right now. It's a mix of placeholder assets, mismatched shaders, and pretty distracting colors. So here's my plan. The lighting engines in old games used something called Guro shading, which is basically just vertex shading. This is extremely easy to implement, and honestly, kind of boring. What we're going to do instead is implement a sophisticated lighting model, but make the game look retro by rendering at a lower resolution, using low resolution texture maps and low polygon geometry. It's gonna be fun, check this out. Do you see anything wrong with this image? Really think about it now. Well. Let's take a look at my original texture map for the counter object, and maybe that will clarify things. Notice how I've shaded these areas by hand because they are probably going to be darker in real life. This is often referred to as ambient occlusion. The problem with my texture is that this is actually a diffuse map. Just because the diffuse color of an object is black does not necessarily imply that it's dark. If you recall in devlog number two, I discussed this phenomenon. The phone is black, but notice how at certain angles it really isn't anymore. It's the color of whatever it's reflecting. This is because many surfaces reflect light as though they have multiple layers. In the most typical case, a rough diffuse layer and a shiny transparent reflective layer on top. My dark shading really doesn't work well on my counter right now, because it has no effect on the specular layer, and you can see this highlight on the countertop is pretty jarring and out of place. I fix this by adding a dedicated ambient occlusion map input to my shader. This ambient occlusion map will attenuate all incoming light rather than just the diffuse color. It has the added benefit that I don't have to draw shading onto the diffuse map, which can be really annoying, especially if you mess up and need to erase a shading mistake. The difference in-game is subtle, but nonetheless looks a lot better than before, and whether you realize it or not, your eye will pick up on these details. With all that out of the way, we can get started painting our other assets. I followed pretty much the same process for the toaster, 
UV mapping, followed by painting, diffuse, and ambient occlusion maps. And the same process again with these cabinets. Having it be practically midnight outside also doesn't really establish the mood that I'm looking for. So the next thing I did was paint a simple sky plane. This object will be unlit in the scene so that it's always sky color and not affected by any lights. I also modeled some basic building facades in the distance for added detail. All right, just a few more assets to go. I really enjoyed this whole process. I'm not an artist by any stretch of the imagination, but I still find it really enjoyable and sort of relaxing actually. For the fridge in particular, it was really fun to try to bring life to it by adding magnets or pictures. This is really what people look for when they're trying to relate to something. Random imperfections that suggest that it is a real object that someone uses as opposed to a few polygons on the screen I used to really overthink assets and obsess over having technically perfect meshes With lots of detail when really you don't need anything too fancy to make a good scene I think I spent like 20 minutes on the placeholder asset for the fridge and I was actually planning to replace it with a better mesh anyway, but as it turns out, especially for this style, it works perfectly, especially after textures are applied. Sometimes it's good to know where and where not to be a perfectionist. Having good quality assets and decent lighting is important, but you can't really move into the 21st century until you have shadows. Shadows are a bit more complex to calculate than specular reflections, for example, but by using something called a shadow map, it's actually not too difficult. I'm assuming most of you generally understand how shadow mapping works, so I won't go into too much detail in this video, but basically it works like this. Take this scene with two objects, a light source, and a camera. Imagine that you position another camera exactly where this light source is. You'll notice that from that camera's point of view, object two will be partly occluded by object one. In other words, anything visible to the light is lit and everything else is in shadow. GPUs determine what is visible by measuring depth. Take this point, it is the closest point to the camera and therefore it is the point that's rendered and everything behind will be hidden. By rendering the scene once from the light's perspective, and saving these distances in something called a shadow map, we can then render the scene again and calculate whether a point is seen or not from the light's perspective. If it is, it is lit. If not, it is in shadow. I used the infrastructure that I put together last episode and added some new shader stages to render shadow maps. And after all that work, here's the final result. As you can see, it's almost a completely different game. Look at the difference compared to what it looked like last week. There are, of course, a lot of assets that still need to be completed, but that was all the time that I had for this week, unfortunately. I hope you guys enjoyed this devlog, and as always, thank you so much for watching. As I've said before, this project is entirely open source, so feel free to check out the code on my GitHub, the link is in the description. At the end of the day, it's all for fun, and to hopefully inspire other people out there to give C++ a chance, and gain an appreciation for low-level programming. If you enjoy my content, then I highly recommend subscribing to my channel, because it really helps me out a lot. Alright, see you guys next time.